At GXS, I'm the Chief Agile Methodologist. Um, basically, what that means is they don't let me program anymore. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> but I do, you know, process and scrum agile rollouts, okay. portfolio planning. So more like how people need to work with each other to produce software? Yeah, yeah. Kind of orchestration between teams and making sure all the, the big wigs know what's going on so they don't mess with the, um, the programmers. Yeah, it, it, that's a tough job. <laughs> I've had to do it. So one of the things that you talked about at O'Reilly's OSCON was Java FX and how it's used. Could you talk a little bit about the state of Java FX? Where it is, wh where it's going? Yeah, so um, there's been a big change in the past year. Um, last year, JavaFX 1.3 was the most recent release, and that was targeted for both desktop and mobile, and had its own UI DSL called JavaFX Script. Mm -hmm. What Oracle did post-acquisition is they essentially put JavaFX 1.3 aside, took a clean look at it in terms of what the development community wanted, and started fresh with Java APIs, um, added in some web controls, different components which were missing from JavaFX 1.3, and finally today released JavaFX 2.0. And so what's the big thing in JavaFX 2.0? The biggest change most develop developers will notice is the Java language APIs. So rather than coding in a, um, a new domain specific language for UI programming, you can use Java even JVM languages like Scala, Clojure, or Groovy to program your JavaFX applications, and the typical Java toolchain applies. So one of the themes in all of these interviews today is polyglot. So everybody's talking about how Java has turned into a collection of languages. And you recently blogged about Scala, writing a JavaFX app using Scala. Can you talk a little bit about how you would go about doing that in terms of tools and in terms of getting something that actually, that actually runs. Yeah, so one of the things which you can do, so most of the JVM languages are nice in that they compile down to the JVM, so you can target anywhere Java runs. And you also can call Java API libraries. So any, any libraries you'd normally have for collections or um, network activity or different things which you can do from Java, you can call from your JVM language and do those natively. But it isn't always convenient, or it doesn't always match the language syntax. So for example, if you wanted to code Scala directly against Java, the code you end up writing looks a lot like Java code written for JavaFX rather than Scala code, because you end up doing things imperatively. You end up using the Java event listeners, and the whole model um, is very Java focused. So what I did, and I announced the project on my blog called ScalaFX, and the goal is to create a set of APIs leveraging some of the new language features in Scala, which actually makes JavaFX feel more like a, a functional declarative programming language. So um, as, as an example, one of the things which it, it does um, is called object literal syntax. So if you've seen lots of UI programming languages, sometimes they'll have an XML complement and you can create nested hierarchical structures for your UIs. Um, object literal syntax is similar to that. It lets you create an object and then assign to one of the fields another object which you create inline and you create a nested tiered hierarchy of objects. Um, and this is something which you can emulate in Java with builders, but it's a little bit clunky. Mm -hmm. In Scala, you can actually do it with a native DSL. Okay, so that makes sense. So, so Scala actually brings things to Java effects that aren't present in the Java APIs. Yeah, yeah, another example, and this one is, was fun to, to develop, is a um, infix binds library. So um, JavaFX 1.3 had a, bind, a binding library where you could create an expression and say, when anything in this expression changes, I want to update this variable. And that was part of the JavaFX script language that was baked into the programming language. Um, JavaFX 2.0 still preserves a bind capability. So it's, it's similar to binding in Flex or other languages. But the way they do it is they do it by a bunch of nested functions, a kind of a fluent interface to binding. And it, it reads more like um, function calls than it does like a real expression. So Scala has both operator overloading and also operator precedence rules. So I was able to create an actual expression language in Scala using uh, essentially a DSL for um, binding, where you can create real natural language expressions 
if-then statements, um, addition, multiplication, um, all the Boolean operators, and just code it like you would normally code, um, and then attach that to a variable, and when anything updates, it automatically calls through the JavaFX APIs. So in terms of the context of JavaFX, one thing, when, and we've already talked about this in the past, is, is it, it's difficult to make the case because you can't deploy it on a mobile phone. Um, but on the other hand, and this was your answer to me l last year, there's a massive amount of, de of, of work on desktop apps. And the thing that you said at, the, at, at, at that point was, Java FX provides a better solution for people who are creating desktop applications than something like Swing. Do you still think that's true? Yeah, no, I, I think, um, so the JavaFX 2.0 release is specifically targeted for desktop right mm -hmm. now. And I think it's well positioned to replace Swing as a cross-platform desktop toolkit. Swing's a little clunky. I mean, Swing has been around since 1895. So, <laughs> so you And think also similar technologies like um, Flex on the desktop, right. um, Qt, or other things people use to build platform applications. So uh, the desktop's evolved far enough where the set of problems and domains and things which you can do is fairly well confined. So cross-platform toolkits can actually do as good or better of a job than native toolkits in those cases. So there's been something of an Android backlash lately. I've just noticed it in the general press. Objective-C is an option if you want to get on the iPhones. JavaFX is kind of there. One day it could be a viable mobile platform, but maybe not right now. Do you see a future that includes this as a technology for mobile? I, I definitely think that if you look at the technology set that JavaFX provides, so you know, multimedia, audio, graphics, a uh, real scene graph for manipulating objects, um, web content, web panes, and different controls and components you can integrate cleanly. And I think that um, feature set is going to be ubiquitous across different platforms. So you'll see you know, Android picking up more natural APIs and moving towards that, same thing with iOS. And um, what you can do with rich applications on different platforms will evolve in that direction. Um, one of the value propositions JavaFX has the potential for, and they haven't yet taken advantage of, is since it's not targeted for a specific OS, it's targeted to a virtual machine, it could be pushed across different devices and different platforms. It's technically feasible for Oracle to do that with the technology. They've chosen not to in the first release, but um, I think it's something they could in future releases of JavaFX actually um, expand the platform to support. I remember. Years ago at a Java One, Jonathan Schwartz got up in front of us. There was a man in a African robe <laughs> standing there, and they were talking about how Java FX was going to be uh, core in the developing world. And they were talking about uh, do do donating phones. Um, at that time, it now turns out that they were talking to Google about licensing Java. Um, four or five years, there's been there's been disagreement between. Sun and Oracle and Google. Do you think that this huge legal fight has gotten in the way of Java FX as a technology becoming a viable target for mobile development? Yeah, it actually it's it's gotten in the way in multiple different um, avenues. The most obvious is Oracle's mobile strategy. Um, they can't do much with mobile right now since they're involved with a lawsuit with Google. There's no partnership opportunities. Similarly, Google can actually take JavaFX or other technologies and leverage those on the Android platform. So there's a, a big wall put up by the lawsuit between these two companies. Another example is just the JavaFX script language itself. So besides being a well-suited UI DSL for JavaFX, which is what it was intended for for JavaFX 1.3 and prior, I've actually been doing work with it to um, put the Visage language, that's the successor to JavaFX script, on Android devices. So rather than coding against JavaFX APIs, you're coding against Android APIs, but it gets you a clean declarative language to build your Android applications with, which merges together what you have to write today with XML and Java code. You can mix together in one application with a cleaner um, representation. All right, great, we have to wrap up, but one last question is how do I learn more about this tool that you just described? Um, so the Visage project is open source. 
um, the website's visagelang.org and it's hosted on Google Code. And all the stuff I've been talking about is um, mentioned on my blog, steveonjava.com. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right.